So uh, carrying on with the UQ theme, or it's uh, Nadim's last day with us at Otago, and so he flies off to, to Queensland later on this week, or maybe next week. Um, so uh, Nadim is going to talk to us about past, uh, past developments, current trends, and future challenges in sustainable accounting and reporting. So Nadim, the floor is yours. Um, you, this is your last action as an Otago employee, and let me thank you for all your efforts at Otago. Right. Uh, here are everyone here and good afternoon or good morning to those who are online, wherever you are. And thank you, SAP Group and uh, the organizing committee for providing me with this excellent opportunity to be able to stand here and deliver this keynote speech before I finish my things off at Otago. And what a way to finish this off. So I'm going to talk about a topic or a field that has never been more important and relevant than it is today. Yes, it's sustainability accounting and reporting. So I'm gonna talk about some of the recent and past developments in this field. And I will spend relatively more time on the challenges that this field is currently facing and will probably continue to face at least in the near future. So um, hopefully Iwan will be kind enough to give me some extra minutes also. <laughs> okay, so let me begin by answering a question that comes to uh, some people's minds or at least businessmen's minds that does it pay or does it matter to be green and I'm gonna add responsible too. So does it pay to be greener or responsible? Now, if we dig into the literature, if we are an academic and most of us are, we dig into this literature, we find arguments both in favor of and against this notion. So if we look at it from the neoclassical economics models, we will find uh, you know, arguments saying that sustainability actually uh, destroys farm value through misallocation of resources. So basically the opponents of this idea, they argue that the resources that you spend on sustainability, you could actually spend those to expand your businesses. And they also argue that it's basically a compromise between farm value maximization and environmentalism. So they will say that it, if you help the environment, you actually hurt your own business. So this is the arguments that you find from this strand of the literature. However, when we look at the proponents, those who are in favor of sustainability, and we look at it, we, we find the arguments in favor of sustainability accounting. And the arguments say that sustainability accounting is is favorable for businesses, not only financially, but non-financially, both financially as well as non-financially. So we look at it from an investor's perspective, why sustainability accounting is important for a business. So they, these authors, these people maintain that sustainability practices actually increase firm value. So you might have heard this saying, doing well by doing good. So there are some empirical evidence also that firms that do engage in sustainability practices, they actually have better access to financial resources at much competitive cheaper rates than those firms that do not engage in sustainability practices. And a recent, um, a, a recent example that comes to my mind from New Zealand is that a big, a big bank, I guess it was BNZ recently last year announced that they, they were willing to lend about 50 million US 
uh, New Zealand dollars to Sinolite, uh, which is a dairy company. But the condition was that if the company hits on sustainability targets, then they will be able to offer them very competitive rates, uh, lower rates than the market. However, if Sinolite does not achieve those targets, then they have to pay higher cost. So that means sustainability practices do contribute to farm value in different ways. And these practices are not always costly, but they sometimes can save cost also. So think about eco-innovation, that when you find ways to produce products in innovative or cost-efficient way, you actually save costs for your company. And more recently, we have some, done some research in this area too, that the investors nowadays, they perform negative or positive screening. So positive screening, if you are a green company, if you have green credentials, you are welcome to their portfolio. However, if you do not have green credentials, then the investors are likely to shun you out or uh, they are not likely to keep you in their portfolio. So. This is another reason why sustainability accounting is relevant for investors. Now, if we look at it from a broader, you know, stakeholders perspective, why sustainability is important, then there are things that come to our minds. And the number one, the most important one is climate change and global warming. We have been warming this, uh, this planet at much higher rate than we anticipated or we should be doing. So the rising temperatures and sea levels has already caused huge havoc around the world. We have seen bushfires uh, at different places. We have seen, you know, catastrophic uh, rains recently in Pakistan, and that was the heaviest in the living memory of this planet that caused huge uh, floods. And we have seen droughts around the world. And another important point is biodiversity loss. Uh, we have been uh, damaging, endangering biodiversity at much higher rate than we shouldn't, than we should be doing. So, according to some estimates, we are actually endangering about 40,000 species a year. That is about 100 a day or four species every hour. And now you could ask a question and that, so what? Does it really matter to protect biodiversity? Well, I, I'm not going to talk about the benefits of protecting biodiversity for the ecosystem, but what is the financial or monetary value that we get from the ecosystem of this planet? So according to some estimates, we get, three, uh, we get many trillion dollars or worth uh, goods and services from the ecosystem or biodiversity. So we are not only uh, endangering the survival of this planet, but we are also putting at risk trillions of dollars that we get every year from uh, biodiversity and ecosystem. And then more recently, the wastage, the plastic waste is becoming big issue and e-waste due to you know, uh, so many challenges with properly implementing uh, uh, disposals or wastage practices related to e-waste. This is becoming another huge issue for the environment. So from the stakeholder, we again see why sustainability accounting is so important, not only uh, non-financially, but financially as well. Let's look at some of the past developments uh, in this field. And uh, although it started way before than this, but I will start from 1987 when we hit the major milestone. And that was basically the publication of this report, Our Common Future. Now, why this report was so important was because this is the report that used the words, the term sustainable development for the first time. So that is when this term came, came into existence, which means meeting the needs of the present generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And then, Immediately after that, 1989, so first environmental report was published. We, we heard to another keynote speaker early on that climate finance might be new into this field, but I see the sustainability accounting is, I guess, much more older because the first, published, the first environmental report was published in year 1989, so almost more than 30 years ago. And then in 1992, we saw the United Nations Framework Convention of, on Climate Change was signed by about 150 countries. And then 1994, another milestone when we saw what is known as the triple bottom line, people, planet, and of course, the profits. 
And then in 1997, we saw the adoption of Kyoto protocols to protect the environment and this planet. 1997, we saw the introduction of GRI, what will then go on to become most widely used framework around the world and the green, green, greenhouse gas protocols in 1998. And then we saw carbon disclosure pro, pro, project in 2000. So this is a nonprofit organization that collects data on incorporate environmental initiatives on voluntary basis. And then in year 2010, we saw IARC, which is international organization. Uh, we saw ISO 26000 as well as International Integrated Reporting Council that sets out framework for integrated reports. In year 2011, Sustainability Accounting Board, which is SASB, again, the purpose of this establishment was to set out uh, reporting guidelines for the entities. And then we saw SDGs, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 and science-based target initiatives. And another really important one, 2015, which is TCFD recommendations, which is now setting the guidelines for climate disclosures for entities to be followed around the world. So these are some of the past developments, of course, not the exhaustive list. We can basically categorize these developments into three major time periods. This is not the ideal categorization, but this is still uh, better than having nothing. So this is, uh, there are three periods called pre-standardization period, which spans from 1960 to 1998, then standardization period from 1990 to uh, 1999 to 2016, and then post-standardization period from 2016, so on. So this pre-standardization period is the period when the concept of sustainability was actually con conceptualized and understood by the firms as well as stakeholders when the pressure actually started to build around companies to do uh, for the environment. So initial milestones were achieved during this time period, including uh, you know, the triple bottom line, et cetera. And then the standardization period is really uh, you know, important. So going back to this first period, we also saw towards the end of this first period, uh, towards the end of 80s, as well as 90s, we also saw introduction of many theories that nowadays explain firm's behavior around sustainability. We saw stakeholder theory, we saw, we saw agency theory, and many theories that now explain corporate disclosure practices. Uh, corporate disclosures on financial as well as non-financial matters. So the pressure was built during this time period. And then in 19, in the second time period, which is also known as standardized st standardization period, this is the period when we saw the introduction of many frameworks around the world. So basically standardization of the disclosure practices. So this is the time when we saw both uh, you know, um, formal and informal institutions uh, being um, organized, coming together and pressurized companies to follow certain standards to disclose on sustainability. And then the most recent or third category post-standardization period is where we are today. So this is the period where we have started to see sustainability uh, reporting becoming mandatory now. So for example, New Zealand is going to make climate disclosures mandatory and some other countries are also following the lead in the near future. So this is the era where this is becoming a mandatory regime now. So these are some of the milestones that are achieved in those, uh, you know, three uh, respective time periods. Uh, I have basically covered pretty much all those uh, three categories. Now, just to give some academic touch to this presentation and look at the empirical evidence that actually provide you know, evidence for the consequences and benefits of sustainability accounting and reporting. And this is where I do most of my research. So I have a couple of slides on this. And I will start with the benefits of sustainability reporting that what are some of the empirical evidence pointing towards the benefits that companies can achieve 
from sustainability reporting or sustainability accounting or reporting. So for example, better access to certain markets, cost of capital, for example, then it's also a tool for risk management and relation with external stakeholders. So if you are no, not doing sustainability, but your peers are doing, you are going to lose competitive advantage. You are going to lag behind. So it's kind of risk management strategy. Then sustainability information is, of course, value relevant. There are empirical evidence that points towards the value relevance of sustainability info information for different stakeholders. It also creates insurance-like benefits. So for example, if you have been uh, greener, if you have been responsible and something happens to your company in the future, you are more likely to recover out of those uh, crises compared with those firms that have been irresponsible in the past. So kind of insurance benefits you get by engaging in sustainability practices. And it's also good for labor cost and retention benefits. Some employees simply want to work for greener or responsible companies. Some of the determinants from the literature, uh, uh, and we have different categories. So for example, board of directors, female directors, independent directors, having subcommittees of the board and having CEO pay linked with performance or ESG uh, will actually drive uh, fund sustainability practices. And then there are some external corporate governance mechanisms as well. For example, institutional ownership, regulatory bodies and NGO activism that pressurize companies towards sustainability practices. And then some firm specific uh, characteristics as well, for example, Example, firm size, media visibility, industry sensitivity, etc. So, having seen those developments, where do we stand today? So, although voluntary, mostly voluntary around the world, we can see huge increase in sustainability reporting. And according to this KPMG report recently published in 2020, about 80% of the 5,200 companies that were surveyed during that survey about 80% of the companies did report on sustainability. So the picture looks greener for now, but is it really green? Now, to answer that question, we look at some of the challenges that this field is facing at the moment and might continue to face uh, going forward. And CSR decoupling is, for example, the biggest challenge that this field is facing. And some of the examples that I have mentioned here, for example, Volkswagen getting, you know, Green Car of the Year Award for consec consecutive two years in 2000, I guess, eight or nine or nine or 10. And suddenly later on, after a few years, we saw that big scandal, Volkswagen Gate, where we saw the company was cheating their emissions, total emission levels. So that is a kind of CSR decoupling. And then we also saw the example of BP when the company invested more resources on developing a green sun logo than what they spent on renewable energy sources in that particular uh, given year. And then we also saw Apple that started to publish their first ever sustain supplier responsibility report. They said that we do not only look after our own sustainability matters, but we are going a step further. And we talk about, uh, we also make sure that our suppliers are responsible too. However, after the publication of that report, we saw some investigations and we saw evidence that the labor rights violations were still happening at one of their suppliers locations, which is Foxconn factory in China. So this is how companies, you know, just trying to uh, talk the walk rather than actually walking the talk. And the most recent example, uh, we might know that who sponsored this recent COP27 in, in Egypt. So you, if you don't already know, you will be surprised. The biggest polluter, what they claim as biggest polluter in the world, Coca-Cola actually sponsored this COP27 recently in in Egypt. So this is how, you know, managers try to simply walk the talk rather than talking the walk. So CSR decoupling is a big challenge faced by this uh, field that you are not really sure the information that you have in your hand is reliable, is credible or not, whether you can use that for your decision making or not. 
Then another challenge that this field is facing is the proliferation of reporting frameworks. We have so many frameworks available that managers do get confused which one to follow. For example, GRI, SASB, IIRC, ICMM, especially for mining companies. Then we also have, you know, uh, TCFD recommendations nowadays. So. Uh, one of the research findings is that exist in the literature that does point towards the fact that sometimes managers simply, you know, get confused which one to follow. So they actually end up following the one that is favorable for them uh, that serves their purpose. And then another biggest challenge is that a lot of uh, arguments exist that we haven't yet made sure whether this sustainability information is for stakeholders or shareholders. So that is another challenge that we are facing that whether this information should be focused on shareholders or uh, stakeholders. When I say shareholders means all the investors. So companies get confused whether to, fo to follow TCFD, for example, which is more you know, focused on financial information for financial investors. And then on the other hand, on the opposite side, we have UNSDGs that focus more on the you know, planet or the environment. So from stakeholder perspective, this is another thing that is confusing the managers at the moment, whether our information is targeted for investors uh, uh, or the broader stakeholder groups. Then another challenge is the materiality issue. So we have seen some challenges such as single versus double materiality. So companies would prefer to disclose information that they think is material, whereas, whereas we want companies to disclose, disclose information that we think is material for us. So there is always a confusion whether companies should be looking at single materiality or double materiality that they should disclose every information that possibly could influence stakeholder perception. And then there are some material uh, measurement issues uh, because if you cannot measure something, you cannot really manage or report. So there continues to be measurement issues. And this is uh, one of the reports just published a few days back. And this again came out of the COP27. And the report claims that the oil and gas greenhouse gas emissions are actually three times higher than what we see in the reports or what the producers claim. So definitely there exists, there exists some measurement issues that needs to be resolved. We know there are so many science-based models available nowadays. However, this report recently found that the actual uh, greenhouse gas emissions are much higher. And then there continues to be an issue around the assurance, the availability of assurance providers, the standards that are available for assurance providers to be followed because there is a there is a article uh, published in this area and that article claims that the assurance providers um, uh, use the available uh, available assurance standards according to their own desires. So because there are no specific standards available, they can do actually whatever they want to. So assurance again continues to be an issue. And then another, and I guess the last challenge that is facing, uh, this field is facing is harmonization of the standards. We have seen a lot of efforts uh, going into harmonizing the financial uh, reporting standards, for example, IFRS and uh, gap generally uh, accepted accounting principles. So many efforts have been made to harmonize those standards, but nothing has really happened so far over the years. And simi similar ha efforts have started uh, to be, you know, to try and harmonize the non-financial reporting standards. And we have already seen plenty of uh, non-financial reporting standards available. So uh, I'm not sure whether it could be, there could be a harmony in the future or not, so that it can make it clear for the managers where the information is going, who is our target audience, and they can report accordingly. So harmonization of these these different standards will continue be continue to be an issue uh, going forward. Do we have a few minutes? Yeah. 
Okay, so where do we stand today? Again, I will finish this by uh, this uh, more recent finding from COP27 few days back that carbon emissions from fossil fuels hit record high this year, record high, higher than ever before. So despite all those efforts, despite all those claims that a lot of govern, government agencies are making around the world that we are trying our best to cut emissions. We are trying our best to cut the rising temperatures. And we are doing this, we are doing that. Despite all those claims, this is the most recent finding that the carbon emissions are at record level this year, which again points back to that CSR decoupling that whether what the companies or the managers claim, are those claims true and uh, trustworthy? So I will close this presentation here by saying that it's a long journey, however, it is in the right direction. So we might see some positive outcomes going forward in the near future. Thank you so much. Wonderful, Nadim. Really, really great. And um, something it really hit home. Something that I feel a little bit overwhelmed as a finance researcher is all, all these reporting standards and frameworks. Right. Um, I, I mean, even as a sort of specialist in climate finance, I, I feel find it difficult to to keep up. And and so I, you know, there, there must be an yeah. I, I don't imagine if you're a corporate and you're looking at this area for the first time, where where do you start? Right. Cool. Um, any questions on the table? Uh-huh. Um, how can accounting researchers in this area of sustainability accounting contribute to harmonizing um, a lot of the issues um, that you've raised in terms of um, lack of standards, lack of comparability and so forth. Um, what do you see as the role of the field in bringing some sense to all of this, you know, confusion around reporting um, on sustainability? Mm -hmm. Great it's, question, Andre. It's, it's a great question. And uh, well, if we look at the harmonization efforts, been performed previously to harmonize financial reporting standards, IFRS and GAAP principle. We have seen, you know, we haven't seen much progress on that. Uh, I wouldn't say that those efforts have failed, but we simply haven't seen much progress. And same has started, you know, with the non-financial reporting that people are already talking about harmonization. Now, how do accounting academics can play their role is, I guess one of the ways they can perform their role is maybe um, by doing some qualitative research, by interviewing the managers that, to looking at their perception, how do they think that all these standards create confusion for them, to what extent they are able to understand these different standards and which one do they think are better. And then maybe doing the same thing with different stakeholders that what sort of standards they think provide them with better information. So that is one way of doing that. And then of course the comparability, some research could be done on what standards are more similar, provide comparable information and what standards actually take everything away from the other. So maybe some sort of evidence there as well. So I guess this is one of the ways that sustainability accounting people can actually help to speed up the harmonization process. And of course, uh, another way, and I don't think the accounting academics can play a big role here is but by making the reporting, stand, reporting mandatory like what's happening in New Zealand now, those financial institutions from next year, when they start preparing the climate disclosure reports, they have to follow, they must follow the climate standards produced by Aotearoa, um, external XRB Aotearoa. So this is another way of harmonization that making it mandatory, then companies have to follow those. And I'm not saying that they all should be harmonized, but what I'm saying is that for comparability and comparison purposes, 
it will be good that you take those standards and maybe customize according to the requirements in the different geographical areas like what is New Zealand is doing, basically taking the TCFD recommendations and customizing according to our requirements. So that might be another way of doing that. But I mean, looking at what has happened to the financial reporting standards, I'm not too optimistic to see a big change or harmonization in this field in the near future, but that might happen once more and more countries make it mandatory. But is, is there just a lot more variety right now in, yeah. in, the, in the sustainability space than there is in the financial accounting? In, in the financial accounting, in essence, we have two, right? Yes, yes. So are we gonna end up with two or two or three and, and which are gonna be those two or three? If so, if you had to put money, and I know you're not a gambler, <laughs> uh, if you, but if you had to, uh, you know, make your best education guess, mm -hmm. which of these standards do you think will ultimately dominate or, or which, which, which are most likely to, 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 to become most credible and adopted widely? Well, I think we first need to make it clear that who is the target audience of this information, whether it should be stakeholder focus or shareholder or investor focused. And we saw the introduction of another new entity on the, during the last COP last year, COP27, COP we saw IFRIS uh, coming up with a, a body and the purpose of that body is actually to, to harmonize these in different standards. So again, we have seen some criticism on that also because by the nature, uh, IFRS is more lean towards financial reporting. So it's fear that they might come up with standards that focus more on financial reporting and they might start ignoring non-financial information. So we have seen academics criticizing what they are doing at the moment and basically pushing them to consider the wider stakeholder audience, wider environment and society issues. So I guess, UNSDGs was a good starting point, but they are too broad. But at the same time, uh, TCFD is good initiative. However, I would say it's too focused on the investors. So somewhere in the middle ground. You're focused on what, sorry? Investors, okay. because it's yeah. to it talks about financial, you know, disclosures, climate-related financial disclosures. So I would say somewhere in the middle, yes, information for investors, as well as information for the general stakeholders. I mean, it's fascinating. There's a standards war going on, right? Yeah. And, uh, I, I, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the COP26. Last year. And, yeah. and, yeah, I've seen some pretty um, some pretty strong LinkedIn standards. International, oh, yeah, I remember the name. Very, very, no. very passionate about it. International. It, it feels like they're trying to take over yes. and water it down. Um, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it's a fascinating space, um, Nadim. Um, on behalf of Otago University, <laughs> thank you very much for, for your years of service and thank you very much for this excellent thank speech. Uh, if we can show our gratitude. Thank you.